Well, um, I do appreciate everyone um, for letting me participate. I'm really excited about the Watershed Academy and what the Kentucky Water Resource Research Institute's doing. Um, so thank you to Steve and everyone who's uh, been working so hard to, to get this academy up and running. I think this is really great. So I'm just really excited to be part of this. So this is me and this is what I do. Uh, a lot of my work depends on water and uh, my livelihood depends on water. Um, and so here I am uh, seeing if I'm checking my math calculations, checking to see if uh, if I calculated the right buoyancy for a floating wetland island. So I'm willing to put myself out there and uh, take some chances, but um, it's all for the all for good fun and, and good good water. Uh, this is another aspect of what I do. Do a lot of educational programs, do some tours. So this is in a, a big rain garden at the Coca-Cola bottling facility on Leastown Road in Lexington. Um, this is a picture of that facility from Google. Um, and uh, up on the up right hand corner, you see a Coke bottle shaped rain garden. So that's one of my pride and joys, my, my babies. Uh, so that's the kind of work I do. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is we really want the object, objective of this presentation is to achieve greater benefits and results of our watershed projects. Uh, we're going to share some lessons learned, examples and insights. Uh, we'll have some time for questions. Um, one question I've got is how could this presentation support your projects? So I've got my email address um, down at the bottom. I would encourage anyone to um, write down some questions during the presentation. I'll be happy to follow up. Uh, you all are willing to take your time to listen to me uh, go on uh, my uh, my first webinar. So um, I'm willing to take the time and um, follow up on any questions you have. And I just want to make sure this fits with the work you're doing. Um, if we could live by these words, we wouldn't have to have this meeting. <laughs> if we uh, treated everyone downstream as we'd want those upstream to do to us, we wouldn't have to worry about water quality. And if we had a money tree that grew money, we would have all the resources we need to uh, address water quality and, and watershed issues, but we don't. Um, and so I'm gonna be speaking a little bit from the perspective of a small business a contractor, a for-profit organization. And so I want to talk a little bit about some basic terms that are, I think, helpful to keep in mind um, as you approach projects. Um, going back to the, some of the basics of economics, cost is the dollar amount to produce or provide a service. Price, it's the, the dollar amount charged for that. The benefit is what a consumer can gain from those goods or services. And the value is what the consumer or user perceives that worth to be. So I'm going to follow up on these concepts a little bit more and dial it in. Um, value is something that's subjective and relative. Um, the approach I usually take on projects is looking at a value added approach. And I want to increase the, the margin between what it costs or the price of a project and what the benefit and value is. Um, I want to provide a result or outcome that's greater than the price paid. That provides an incentive for a project to happen. Um, so again, our clients might say we undercharged for the value that we provided. That's kind of what we want to hear. Um, so how does this kind of relate to something like doing a riparian buffer planting? The cost for doing uh, planting a tree, I could plant a locust tree or I could plant a white oak tree for the same price. The difference for benefit or value would be if I was talking to a landowner who was interested in a honey operation, they would really value having the locust tree. If I was talking to a landowner who maybe produced corn and that corn was used for distillery products, uh, bourbon industry, anything like that, they might be more interested in planting some of the white oaks and being part of the white oak initiative. So the point is the cost can be the same, the value and benefit, you have to sometimes adjust that per your situation or your um, partnership. Um, so for example, if a stream bank stabilization, the basic need could be approached by concrete, uh, hard 
surfaces, things like that, or a softer green approach. Um, when you start looking about some of the differences, if if using a nature based approach helps keep the water cooler, helps increase dissolved oxygen, can increase the safety of park users or is more attractive. That's one thing that might um, change a partner's decision. Um, in this case, this is a little example on the left. There was in this watershed a, a, a outstanding preference for green options. So that's that's kind of what uh, led the client to go with this approach. Um, another thing is that when you're looking at green infrastructure in the wider sense, there's a lot of different aspects and benefits that can be rolled in. Some of these are hard to put a dollar amount to or quantify, but they um, revolve around social, economic and environmental factors. Um, there's a lot of, you know, more research out there about how does green infrastructure affect, affect health and safety in a community. Um, a lot more going on with trees and health and well-being. Um, this is on the UK's website. Um, again, making that connection between our green infrastructure in a broad sense and health and well-being. Um, again, in, in um, the Parklands in Louisville. Uh, you know, they're making a connection between green infrastructure, which is parks, which is stream corridors and urban forestry. Uh, the YMCA is partnered with them doing a lot of well-being. So I, I want to encourage you to think about that and how to include these other parameters into projects. Um, trees especially, you can look at um, how trees affect stormwater and you can actually get some dollar amounts. If you go to the National Tree Benefit Calculator, which is www.treebenefits.com, you can enter some information about a specific tree and it will give you that little pie chart on the left with a dollar amount for your tree's benefits. Um, that might be something that you could um, use in conversations with uh, potential partners. Um, oftentimes, landscaping and plants tends to increase property values Trees in particular tend to increase in both benefits and value over time. Um, so that might be something you want to include in your conversation for developing some watershed projects. This is an example. Um, this is Woodfield Pond in Lexington, Kentucky. It's a HOA owned um, pond. This was in 2006. We got called in to help address an erosion problem with a lot of stormwater runoff getting into their pond, washing out the banks. Um, this is the result that we came up with. We are very biased for native plants and a green or ecological approach. Um, and so this is that same area in 2018. Trees growing up, we got a you know vegetated stream buffer. One of the lessons I learned on this project is that not everybody really likes the um, dense vegetation. Um, that's a whole nother topic about uh, people's experience with nature and nature connectedness. So that's a whole nother realm, but I think that's pretty important to be aware of. Um, a lot of people, this, you know, this is a project I've really wanted to, to do something with. I see this as a blank canvas. It's just ripe and ready for a lot of bank stabilization and vegetation. The HOA that um, owns this parcel, they like it the way it is. Uh, so a lesson learned for me is you know, going back to value is perceived worth. Um, again, it's very subjective from person to person. You really have to think about if you're working with a potential partner, their history, their experiences, what their expectations are. You need to understand what motivates your clients. And I would encourage you to think about stakeholders as clients. Um, you want to make sure you're working with key decision makers who have the agency or capacity to sustain your project. So it's not just um, a loud voice or someone who's really high spirited and um, wants to do some project, but doesn't have the decision making authority to do that. So you need to make sure you're, you're, you've got your key partners on board um, decision makers. Um, how would your client see a positive return on investment? What makes it worthwhile for them? Um, you want to provide a situation that are worth more than the cost of doing nothing. So I'd encourage you to kind of think about those aspects a little bit when you're approaching some of these urban projects. 
Uh, this is another example of what we did. Uh, this is Lexington Green Shopping Center in um, end of Lexington, of course. They approached us because they've got eroded um, pond banks and a lot of geese and wanted something to stabilize the banks. So um, we gave them a lot of wildflowers. And uh, so here's some before and after pictures. Um, so some of the benefits that they got out of this that they weren't looking for, they didn't expect, um, you know, we did some to some degree increase the safety uh, for users in the, the mall area. Um, we did reduce sediment and dredging in the pond from all the soil that was washing in. They won the Lexington in Bloom Award, so they were very happy to receive that. Um, we've gone to help reduce some of the goose poop, so we're looking at bacteria and nutrient reduction, which again, they weren't asking for that. Um, immediately, we found that we helped reduce the cost of aqua shade. So that's the colorant that's used to control algae. Um, so we did see right off the bat a 50% reduction in their expenses, their operational expenses. Um, and they got an environmental commission award. But more than that, they get people really attracted to the mall. People stay there longer and tend to spend more money. It makes it a higher value place. So there's some financial repercussions for doing something that was just started uh, to address erosion. Uh, this is another project, Mill Creek Elementary, also in Lexington. These are before pictures. This was 2009. Uh, we had somebody with Fayette County Public Schools said, we've got a problem with erosion on a stream bank at a school. Can you help us? We said, sure, that's what we do. So we got a big partnership together. We found funding with Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Wetland and Stream Mitigation Program. That got more partners involved. We got University of Louisville, University of Kentucky. We ended up getting a five-star restoration grant challenge grant from the EPA. So once you know you get some partners involved, it can really snowball. Great project. So this was featured in both Sustain, part of the University of Louisville's publications, also the Kentucky Dep Department of Fish and Wildlife newsletter from the uh, commissioner. Uh, we got a lot of students involved building a wetland. That's probably the first time they've ever built a wetland and kids are going to remember that day. Um, we got to work with Tom Bigbyhauser, who is probably more excited than those 20 kids around him. Uh, a lot of fun to work with. So, um, you know, we created some memories on that situation. That So, again, adding value as a contractor or as a partner, um, that's what we're looking for, some of those experiences. Um, so, after that, this is a, 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 a post-construction. Uh, pictures so they have stream days for hands-on environmental education at the school uh, it did increase safety because of the way we reshaped the banks really increased a lot of stream wildlife habitat reduced mowing um, university of louisville used it for doing some monitoring and academic research um, so there was a lot of wins out of this because that worked out really well, we had another project with uh, Fayette County Public Schools. They're re remodeling Clay's Mill Elementary in around 2013. This is a before picture of their creek, their creek and their rickety old bridge. Um, we actually pulled out a lot of honeysuckle just to see this. So this is a, a little channel that's about three feet wide and about three feet deep and just really nothing that's really supporting any kind of aquatic habitat. Um, again, we got a lot of partners together. This is some uh, project that was funded by the city of Lexington's um, stormwater quality management fee program, the incentive grant program. And um, again, just brought in a lot of partners who want to sign on on this and and work together. Uh, we got students involved planting the trees. So this was another thing that the uh, fourth and fifth graders got to be involved with. And now, you know, they're stakeholders in this because uh, they've they've invested in it. Um, so that was a lot of fun, too. I'm sure they're going to remember that day when they got to go out in the cold <laughs> and plant trees. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like now. Um, so we did increase a lot of the safety. We got the hands on environmental education programs, did a lot of uh, environmental uh, the, the wildlife uh, habitats increased, reduced a lot of mowing cost. Um, and the park users really enjoy it quite a bit. And it got some uh, publicity in the South Sider uh, news article. 
and it's still working to do a lot of things. Um, we uh, have had some uh, workshops and volunteer trainings out there. So that's what this is in 2018. Two of, of my she rows, Dr. Carmen Agritas and Amanda Gumbert there were leading uh, stream stewards in a, uh, a workshop on site. So it's been really cool. Um, we applied some of the stuff towards a project in Lexington, the Green Acres neighborhood, doing a stream corridor. So it goes through a park and uh, through some buyout properties, so behind people's backyards. Uh, so it's a pretty urban area. Uh, looking at the three different zones for a stream buffer and applied some agroforestry principles to this. And what I'm showing you the same slide here, but you'll notice a different colors for different areas. So I used different management plans in different situations based on visibility, usage, and things of that nature. Um, one of the things I'm doing there is kind of a value added thing is uh, built it as a community food, food forest. So if we're gonna plant trees, how about some chestnuts, hazelnuts, plums, serviceberry, persimmons, pecans, hickories, pawpaw, the walnut we didn't have to plant and the mulberry we didn't have to plant. They came in on their own. But um, that's one thing I've been really interested in. It's just kind of a value added thing for adding food sources, local free available food sources in areas that are sometimes called food deserts. Uh, we focused a little bit more intention and um, priority on some curb appeal. So that's a term you would hear anybody in real estate using to talk about the front, the facade of a project. Um, so we invested a little bit more as far as plant materials in those areas. Um, we keep a single pass of mar width along the fence, and that helps in a lot of urban projects because sometimes people are just not too comfortable with the tall, thick vegetation. Um, so this is another project, um, the UK FEMA Alumni Drive project. We started this in 2015. This is a shot in 2016 after it was built. Um, we had a lot of uh, beneficial pollinators show up out of the blue. Um, the monarch butterflies and, and all kinds of bees and beetles and all that kind of stuff. So this was uh, used for some research for entomology as well as the biosystems and ag engineering research. Uh, so this is what the project looked immediately after construction in 2015. This is one year, first year of growth, 2016, 2017. 2018, 2019, and this week, 2020. So it's come a long way and it's been really exciting to see. And I think a, a, a pretty big icon for um, the landscape in the south end of UK's campus. Um, so this project, I said this was a UK FEMA project. So this was FEMA funded. Um, many of you all might know the story that um, kind of spurred this project, which was about um, some students getting washed away by high flows down this area, um, which passes under Nicholasville Road. Um, so safety was certainly paramount. Um, it did reduce flooding, but certainly increases some of the stream base flow, which helps a lot of the, the stream wildlife. Uh, and certainly we educate it incorporated with some educational programs and academic research, again, reducing mowing and increasing the wildlife and, and beautification of the campus. Since that worked out really well, we got to do another one on the other end of Alumni Drive. Um, we built this one in 2019. So this is facing to the east towards the Tates Creek Road side. And uh, a, pro a question we often we get is, um, how can you call this restoration? It looks like a tornado just tore it up. So that was a person walking by I spoke with uh, at this site and, and he's got a great point. It does look like a tornado just went through, um, which leads me to the another topic that I think gets missed is looking at things as ecological succession. A project is going to change. Um, it's easier to work with the flow of secession than fighting it. So you see on the graph is kind of um, the progression of a Kentucky landscape. After, If you got disturbance, which would be on the left side, if you got an open field or anything like that, you just leave it alone. Over time, it will move towards the right and 
change from herbaceous plants to shrubs and certain communities of trees, and then those communities shift over time. And it takes a long time to do that. So this is where we're starting at. This is the area we want to get to, and that's our goal, but it's going to take some time. And I think that's one thing that needs to be considered is um, the amount of time that projects can take. Um, I will go through this really quick to keep up with time, but there is a difference between maintenance and management. And um, I think it's a different mindset. And I'll go through this really quick, but maintenance is you want to keep something in an original condition. It's often addressing wear and tear. You want to reduce loss. And it's often thought of a cost or expense to keep something in service. There's no return on investment for, for maintenance. Management on the other side, you're looking for growth and development. You want to build capacity or abilities or increase benefits. It's often thought of an investment. It's profitable. It's a positive return on investment. So when you think about or talk about a project, if you're talking about maintenance, you're trying to keep it in one spot. Management is is encouraging that shift. Um, and if you're talking about a project being finished, um, I think that's kind of a, a trap. <laughs> Because a project probably is never really finished when you're when you're talking about green infrastructure and living systems, living components. I think that's something to really keep in mind. Um, often that gets forgotten after uh, people say the project's finished, it's done and um, don't sustain it. So I think this is really key in sustainability. Again, we are looking at agroforestry practices. This is a management plan I came up with to show some progression of the plant communities on this project over time. And um, we did some planting this year. Uh, we had neighbors that were so interested in it, they came out and volunteered. So we got two more uh, stakeholders doing some planting. Again, I, I like the food forest theme. This is the College of Agriculture land, so the land um, used to be part of the um, experiment station. So I wanted to keep with that history. And um, this is where the project is right now. Um, so this is this month uh, looking downstream once again. So we're in that first year. Things are changing a lot. It's not the treed forest that we're going to see in years to come. That's going to take some time. But anyways, I think I've done a pretty good job of staying on track. I've talked really quick. Um, if we have any time for questions, I'll be happy to do what I can. Otherwise, I've got my phone number. I've got my email address. I really hope that you all would take some time to send me some questions. Let me know, did this make any sense to you? Let me know where I lost you. Um, and I'm certainly glad to do what I can to help you out and uh, help your watershed project succeed. Thank you.